Time of the Twins, Dragonlance Legends, Volume 1, by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, Poetry by Michael Williams, Copyright 1986, TSR Incorporated, All Rights Reserved, Read by John Polk. This book contains 387 pages on 12 sides. Library of Congress Annotation The darkness was over in Kryn with the ending of the War of the Lance, but Raceland Majir wants to see the darkness return. There are only two people who can prevent Raceland from reaching his goal, Caramon, his twin brother, and Chrysania of the House of Tyrinius, who is a cleric of good. But many obstacles stand in their way. Prequel to War of the Twins RC 39686. Some Violence, 1986. From the Book Jacket. The War of the Lands has ended. The darkness has passed. Or has it? One man, the powerful Archmage Raistlin, intends that the darkness return. Two people alone can stop him. One is Chrysania, a beautiful cleric of good who is drawn to Raceland as a moth is drawn to flame. The other is his twin, Caramon, who must come to an understanding of himself before he can redeem his brother. Together with the irrepressible Kender Tasselhoff, these three take a perilous journey back in time to the days just before the Cataclysm. In the doomed city of Istar, poised on the brink of disaster, dark magic and darker ambition battle love and self-sacrifice, in a quest to save not only the world, but more importantly, a soul. The first volume in the second fantasy trilogy set in the world of the Dragonlance saga. To Samuel G. and Alta Hickman My grandpa, who tossed me into bed in his own special way, and my grandma Nanny, who was always so very wise, thank you all for the bedtime stories, life, love, and history. You will live forever. Tracy Ray Hickman This book about the physical and spiritual bonds binding brothers together could be dedicated to only one person, my sister, to Terry Lynn Weiss Wilhelm, with love. Margaret Weiss. Reader's Note. The maps found in the print edition are not included in this recording. End of note. Acknowledgements. We wish to gratefully acknowledge the work of the following. Michael Williams for splendid poetry and warm friendship. Steve Sullivan for his wonderful maps. Now you know where you are, Steve. Patrick Price for his helpful advice and thoughtful criticism. Gene Black, our editor, who had faith in us from the beginning. Ruth Hoyer for cover and interior design. Roger Moore for Dragon Magazine articles and the story of Tasselhoff and the Woolly Mammoth. The Dragonlance team, Harold Johnson, Laura Hickman, Douglas Niles, Jeff Grubb, Michael Dobson, Michael Briault, Bruce Hurd. The 1987 Dragonlance calendar artists, Clyde Caldwell, Larry Elmore, Keith Parkinson, and Jeff Easley. The Meeting A lone figure trod softly toward the distant light. Walking unheard, his footfalls were sucked into the vast darkness all around him. Bertram indulged in a rare flight of fancy as he glanced at the seemingly endless rows of books and scrolls that were part of the Chronicles of Astinus and detailed the history of this world, the history of Kryn. It's like being sucked into time, he thought, sighing as he glanced at the still, silent rows. He wished briefly that he were being sucked away somewhere, so that he did not have to face the difficult task ahead of him. All the knowledge of the world is in these books, he said to himself wistfully, and I've never found one thing to help make the intrusion upon their author any easier. Bertram came to a halt outside the door to summon his courage. His flowing aesthetics robes settled themselves about him, falling into correct and orderly folds. His stomach, however, refused to follow the robe's example and lurched about wildly. Bertram ran his hand across his scalp, 
a nervous gesture left over from a younger age, before his chosen profession had cost him his hair. What was bothering him, he wondered bleakly, other than going in to see the master, of course, something he had not done since... since... he shuddered. Yes, since the young mage had nearly died upon their doorstep during the last war. War. Change, that was what it was. Like his robes, the world had finally seemed to settle around him, but he felt change coming once again, just as he had felt it two years ago. He wished he could stop it. Bertram sighed. I'm certainly not going to stop anything by standing out here in the darkness, he muttered. He felt uncomfortable anyway, as though surrounded by ghosts. A bright light shone from under the door, beaming out into the hallway. Giving a quick glance backward at the shadows of the books, peaceful corpses resting in their tombs, the aesthetic quietly opened the door and entered the study of Astinus of Palanthus. Though the man was within, he did not speak, nor even look up. Walking with gentle, measured tread across the rich rug of lamb's wool that lay upon the marble floor, Bertram paused before the great polished wooden desk. For long moments he said nothing, absorbed in watching the hand of the historian guide the quill across the parchment in firm, even strokes. Well, Bertram? Astinus did not cease his writing. Bertram, facing Astinus, read the letters that even upside down were crisp and clear and easily decipherable. This day, as above Dark Watch Rising 29, Bertram entered my study. Chrysania of the House of Tyrrhenius is here to see you, Master. She says she is expected. Bertram's voice trailed off in a whisper at having taken a great deal of the aesthetic's courage to get that far. Astinus continued writing. Master, Bertram began faintly, shivering with his daring. I... we are at a loss. She is, after all, a revered daughter of Paladine, and I... we found it impossible to refuse her admittance. What she... Take her to my private chambers, Astinus said without ceasing to write or looking up. Bertram's tongue clove to the roof of his mouth rendering him momentarily speechless. The letters flowed from the quill pen to the white parchment. This day, as above after watch rising twenty-eight, Chrysania of Tyrrhenius arrived for her appointment with Raistlin Magir. Raistlin Magir, Bertram gasped, shock and horror prying his tongue loose. Are we to admit he— Astinus looked up now, annoyance and irritation creasing his brow. As his pen ceased its eternal scratching on the parchment, a deep unnatural silence settled upon the room. Bertram paled. The historian's face might have been reckoned handsome in a timeless, ageless fashion, but none who saw his face ever remembered it. They simply remembered the eyes, dark, intent, aware, constantly moving, seeing everything. Those eyes could also communicate vast worlds of impatience, reminding Bertram that time was passing. Even as the two spoke, whole minutes of history were ticking by, unrecorded. Forgive me, Master. Bertram bowed in profound reverence, then backed precipitately out of the study, closing the door quietly on his way. Once outside, he mopped his shaved head that was glistening with perspiration, then hurried down the silent marble corridors of the great library of Palanthus. Astinus paused in the doorway to his private residence, his gaze on the woman who sat within. Located in the western wing of the great library, the residence of the historian was small, and like all other rooms in the library, was filled with books of every type and binding, lining the shelves on the walls and giving the central living area a faint musty odor, like a mausoleum that had been sealed for centuries. The furniture was sparse, pristine. The chairs wooden and handsomely carved, were hard and uncomfortable to sit upon. A low table, standing by a window, was absolutely free of any ornament or object, reflecting the light from the setting sun upon its smooth black surface. 
Everything in the room was in the most perfect order. Even the wood for the evening fire, the late spring nights were cool, even this far north, was stacked in such orderly rows it resembled a funeral pyre. And yet, cool and pristine and pure as was this private chamber of the historian, the room itself seemed only to mirror the cold, pristine, pure beauty of the woman who sat, her hands folded in her lap, waiting. Chrysania of Tyrrhenius waited patiently. She did not fidget or sigh or glance often at the water-run timing device in the corner. She did not read, though Astinus was certain Bertram would have her offered a book. She did not pace the room or examine the few rare ornaments that stood in shadowed nooks within the bookcases. She sat in the straight, uncomfortable wooden chair, her clear, bright eyes fixed upon the red-stained fringes of the clouds above the mountains, as if she were watching the sun set for possibly the first or last time upon Crin. So intent was she upon the sight beyond the window that Astinus entered without attracting her attention. He regarded her with intense interest. This was not unusual for the historian, who scrutinized all beings living upon Crin with the same fathomless, penetrating gaze. What was unusual was that for a moment... A look of pity and of profound sorrow passed across the historian's face. Astinus recorded history. He had recorded it since the beginning of time, watching it pass before his eyes and setting it down in his books. He could not foretell the future. That was the province of the gods. But he could sense all the signs of change, those same signs that had so disturbed Bertram. Standing there, he could hear the drops of water falling in the timing device. By placing his hand beneath them, he could cease the flow of the drops, but time would go on. Sighing, Astinus turned his attention to the woman, whom he had heard of but never met. Her hair was black, blue-black, black as the water of a calm sea at night. She wore it combed straight back from a central part, fastened at the back of her head with a plain, unadorned wooden comb. The severe style was not becoming to her pale, delicate features, emphasizing their pallor. There was no color at all in her face. Her eyes were gray and seemingly much too large. Even her lips were bloodless. Some years ago, when she had been young, servants had braided and coiled that thick black hair into the latest fashionable styles, tucking in pins of silver and of gold, decorating the somber hues with sparkling jewels. They had tinted her cheeks with the juice of crushed berries and dressed her in sumptuous gowns of palest pinks and powdery blues. Once she had been beautiful. Once her suitors had waited in lines. The gown she wore now was white, as befitted a cleric of Paladine and plain, though made of fine material. It was unadorned, save for the belt of gold that encircled her slim waist. Her only ornament was paladines, the medallion of the platinum dragon. Her hair was covered by a loose white hood that enhanced the marble smoothness and coldness of her complexion. She might have been made of marble, Astinus thought. With one difference, marble could be warmed by the sun. Greetings, revered daughter of Paladine, Astinus said, entering and shutting the door behind him. Greetings, Astinus, Chrysania of Tyrrhenius said, rising to her feet. As she walked across the small room toward him, Astinus was somewhat startled to note the swiftness and almost masculine length of her stride. It seemed oddly incongruous with her delicate features. Her handshake, too, was firm and strong, not typical of Palanthian women, who rarely shook hands and then did so only by extending their fingertips. I must thank you for giving up your valuable time to act as a neutral party in this meeting, Chrysania said coolly. I know how you dislike taking time from your studies. As long as it is not wasted time, I do not mind, Astinus replied, holding her hand and regarding her intently. I must admit, however, that I resent this. Why? 
Chrysania searched the man's ageless face in true perplexity. Then, in sudden understanding, she smiled, a cold smile that brought no more life to her face than the moonlight upon snow. You don't believe he will come, do you? Astinus snorted, dropping the woman's hand as though he had completely lost interest in her very existence. Turning away, he walked to the window and looked out over the city of Palanthus, whose gleaming white buildings glowed in the sun's radiance with a breathtaking beauty, with one exception. One building remained untouched by the sun, even in brightest noontime. And it was upon this building that Astinus's gaze fixed. Thrusting itself up in the center of the brilliant, beautiful city, its black stone towers twisted and writhed, its minarets, newly repaired and constructed by the powers of magic, glistened blood-red in the sunset, giving the appearance of rotting, skeletal fingers clawing their way up from some unhallowed burial ground. Two years ago he entered the Tower of High Sorcery, Astinus said in his calm, passionless voice, as Chrysania joined him at the window. He entered in the dead of night in darkness. The only moon in the sky was the moon that sheds no light. He walked through the Shoiken Grove, a stand of accursed oak trees that no mortal, not even those of the Kender race, dare approach. He made his way to the gates upon which hung still the body of the evil mage, who with his dying breath cast the curse upon the tower, and leapt from the upper windows, impaling himself upon its gates, a fearsome watchman. But when he came there, the watchman bowed before him, the gates opened at his touch, then they shut behind him, and they have not opened again these past two years. He has not left, and if any have been admitted, none have seen them. And you expect him here? The master of past and of present, Chrysania shrugged. He came, as was foretold. Astinus regarded her with some astonishment. You know his story? Of course, the cleric replied calmly glancing up at him for an instant, then turning her clear eyes back to look at the tower, already shrouding itself with the coming night's shadows. A good general always studies the enemy before engaging in battle. I know Raistlin Majir very well, very well indeed. And I know he will come this night. Chrysania continued gazing at the dreadful tower, her chin lifted, her bloodless lips set in a straight, even line, her hands clasped behind her back. Astinus's face suddenly became grave and thoughtful, his eyes troubled, though his voice was cool as ever. You seem very sure of yourself, revered daughter. How do you know this? Paladine has spoken to me, Chrysania replied, never taking her eyes from the tower. In a dream, the platinum dragon appeared before me and told me that evil, once banished from the world, had returned in the person of this black-robed wizard, Raistlin Majir. We face dire peril, and it has been given to me to prevent it. As Chrysania spoke, her marble face grew smooth, her gray eyes were clear and bright. It will be the test of my faith I have prayed for. She glanced at Astinus. You see, I have known since childhood that my destiny was to perform some great deed, some great service to the world and its people. This is my chance. Astinus's face grew graver as he listened, and even more stern. Paladine told you this, he demanded abruptly. Chrysania, sensing perhaps this man's disbelief, pursed her lips. A tiny line appearing between her brows was, however, the only sign of her anger. That, and an even more studied calmness in her reply. I regret having spoken of it, Astinus. Forgive me. It was between my God and myself, and such sacred things should not be discussed. I brought it up simply to prove to you that this evil man will come. He cannot help himself. Paladine will bring him. 
Astinus's eyebrows rose so that they very nearly disappeared into his graying hair. This evil man, as you call him, revered daughter, serves a goddess as powerful as Paladine, Takesis, Queen of Darkness. Or perhaps I should not say serves, Astinus remarked with a wry smile. Not of him. Chrysania's brow cleared. Her cool smile returned. Good redeems its own, she answered gently. Evil turns in upon itself. Good will triumph again, as it did in the War of the Lance against Takesis and her evil dragons. With Paladine's help I shall triumph over this evil, as the hero Tannis Half-Elven triumphed over the Queen of Darkness herself. Tannis Half-Elven triumphed with the help of Raistlin Majir, Astinus said imperturbably. Or is that a part of the legend you choose to ignore? Not a ripple of emotion marred the still placid surface of Chrysania's expression. Her smile remained fixed. Her gaze was on the street. Look, Astinus, she said softly. He comes. I must go, Raistlin said, his breath rasping in his throat. These spasms weaken me. I need rest. The sun sank behind the distant mountains. The sky, lit by the afterglow, was a gem-like purple. Servants entered quietly, lighting the fire in the small chamber of Astinus. Even it burned quietly, as if the flames themselves had been taught by the historian to maintain the peaceful repose of the great library. Chrysania sat once more in the uncomfortable chair, her hands folded once more in her lap, her outward mien was calm and cool, as always. Inwardly her heart beat with excitement that was visible only by a brightening of her gray eyes. Born to the noble and wealthy Tyrrhenius family of Palanthus, a family almost as ancient as the city itself, Chrysania had received every comfort and benefit money and rank could bestow. Intelligent, strong-willed, she might easily have grown into a stubborn and willful woman. Her wise and loving parents, however, had carefully nurtured and pruned their daughter's strong spirit, so that it had blossomed into a deep and steadfast belief in herself. Chrysania had done only one thing in her entire life to grieve her doting parents, but that one thing had cut them deeply. She had turned from an ideal marriage with a fine and noble young man to a life devoted to serving long-forgotten gods. She first heard the cleric Eliston when he came to Palanthus at the end of the War of the Lance. His new religion, or perhaps it should have been called the old religion, was spreading like wildfire through Crin, because newborn legend credited this belief in old gods with having helped defeat the evil dragons and their masters, the dragon high lords. On first going to hear Eliston talk, Chrysania had been skeptical. The young woman, she was in her mid-twenties, had been raised on stories of how the gods had inflicted the cataclysm upon Crin, hurling down the fiery mountain that rent the lands asunder and plunged the holy city of Istar into the blood sea. After this, so people related, the gods turned from men, refusing to have any more to do with them. Chrysania was prepared to listen politely to Eliston, but had arguments at hand to refute his claims. She was favorably impressed on meeting him, Eliston, at that time, was in the fullness of his power. Handsome, strong, even in his middle years, he seemed like one of the clerics of old who had ridden to battle, so some legends said, with the mighty knight Huma. Chrysania began the evening finding cause to admire him. She ended on her knees at his feet, weeping in humility and joy, her soul at last having found the anchor it had been missing. The gods had not turned from men, was the message. It was men who had turned from the gods, demanding in their pride what Huma had sought in humility. The next day, Chrysania left her home, her wealth, her servants, her parents, and her betrothed, to move into the small, chill house that was the forerunner of the new temple Elliston planned to build in Palanthus. Now, two years later, Chrysania was a revered daughter of Paladine 
one of a select few who had been found worthy to lead the church through its youthful growing pangs. It was well the church had this strong young blood. The Liston had given unstintingly of his life and his energy. Now it seemed the God he served so faithfully would soon be summoning his cleric to his side. And when that sorrowful event occurred, many believed Chrysania would carry on his work. Certainly Chrysania knew that she was prepared to accept the leadership of the church. But was it enough? As she had told Astinus, the young cleric had long felt her destiny was to perform some great service for the world. Guiding the church through its daily routines, now that the war was over, seemed dull and mundane. Daily she had prayed to Paladine to assign her some hard task. She would sacrifice anything, she vowed, even life itself, in the service of her beloved God. And then had come her answer. Now she waited in an eagerness she could barely restrain. She was not frightened, not even of meeting this man, said to be the most powerful force for evil now living on the face of Kryn. Had her breeding permitted it, her lip would have curled in a disdainful sneer. What evil could withstand the mighty sword of her faith? What evil could penetrate her shining armor? Like a knight riding to a joust, wreathed with the garlands of his love, knowing that he cannot possibly lose with such tokens fluttering in the wind, Chrysania kept her eyes fixed on the door, eagerly awaiting the tourney's first blows. When the door opened, her hands, until now calmly folded, clasped together in excitement. Bertram entered. His eyes went to Astinus, who sat immovable as a pillar of stone in a hard, uncomfortable chair near the fire. The mage, Raistlin Magir, Bertram said. His voice cracked on the last syllable. Perhaps he was thinking about the last time he had announced this visitor, the time Raistlin had been dying, vomiting blood on the steps of the great library. Astinus frowned at Bertram's lack of self-control and the aesthetic disappeared back through the door as rapidly as his fluttering robes permitted. Unconsciously, Chrysania held her breath. At first she saw nothing, only a shadow of darkness in the doorway, as if night itself had taken form and shape within the entrance. The darkness paused there. "'Come in, old friend,' Astinus said in his deep, passionless voice. The shadow was lit by a shimmer of warmth. The firelight gleamed on velvety, soft, black robes. And then by tiny sparkles, as the light glinted off silver threads, embroidered runes around a velvet cowl. The shadow became a figure, black robes completely draping the body. For a brief moment, the figure's only human appendage that could be seen was a thin, almost skeletal hand, clutching a wooden staff. The staff itself was topped by a crystal ball, held fast in the grip of a carved golden dragon's claw. As the figure entered the room, Chrysania felt the cold chill of disappointment. She had asked Paladine for some difficult task. What great evil was there to fight in this? Now that she could see him clearly, she saw a frail, thin man, shoulders slightly stooped, who leaned upon his staff as he walked as if too weak to move without its aid. She knew his age. He would be about twenty-eight now. Yet he moved like a human of ninety, his steps slow and deliberate, even faltering. What test of my faith lies in conquering this wretched creature? Chrysania demanded of Paladine bitterly. I have no need to fight him. He is being devoured from within by his own evil. Facing Astinus, keeping his back to Chrysania, Raistlin folded back his black hood. "'Greetings again, Deathless One,' he said to Astinus in a soft voice. "'Greetings, Raistlin Magir,' Astinus said without rising. His voice had a faint sardonic note, as if sharing some private joke with the mage. Astinus gestured. May I present Chrysania of the house of Tyrrhenius? 
Wasteland turned. Chrysania gasped. A terrible ache in her chest caused her throat to close, and for a moment she could not draw a breath. Sharp, tingling pins jabbed her fingertips. A chill convulsed her body. Unconsciously, she shrank back in her chair, her hands clenching, her nails digging into her numb flesh. All she could see before her were two golden eyes shining from the depths of darkness. The eyes were like a gilt mirror, flat, reflective, revealing nothing of the soul within. The pupils, Chrysania stared at the dark pupils in rapt horror. The pupils within the golden eyes were the shape of hourglasses, and the face, drawn with suffering, marked with the pain of the tortured existence the young man had led for seven years, ever since the cruel tests in the Tower of High Sorcery left his body shattered and his skin tinged gold. The mage's face was a metallic mask, impenetrable, unfeeling as the golden dragon's claw upon his staff. Revered daughter of Paladine, he said in a soft voice, a voice filled with respect and even reverence. Chrysania started, staring at him in astonishment. Certainly that was not what she had expected. Still, she could not move. Her gaze held her, and she wondered in panic if he had cast a spell upon her. Seeming to sense her fear, he walked across the room to stand before her in an attitude that was both patronizing and reassuring. Looking up, she could see the firelight flickering in his golden eyes. Revered daughter of Paladine, Wasteland said again, his soft voice enfolding Chrysania like the velvety blackness of his robes. I hope I find you well. But now she heard bitter, cynical sarcasm in that voice. This she had expected. This she was prepared for. His earlier tone of respect had taken her by surprise, she admitted to herself angrily. But her first weakness was past. Rising to her feet, bringing her eyes level with his, she unconsciously clasped the medallion of Paladine with her hand. The touch of the cool metal gave her courage. I do not believe we need to exchange meaningless social amenities, Chrysania stated crisply, her face once more smooth and cold. We are keeping Astinus from his studies. He will appreciate our completing our business with alacrity. I could not agree more, the black-robed mage said with a slight twist of his thin lip that might have been a smile. I have come in response to your request. What is it you want of me? Chrysania sensed he was laughing at her. Accustomed only to the highest respect, this increased her anger. She regarded him with cold, gray eyes. I have come to warn you, Raistlin Majir, that your evil designs are known to Paladine. Beware, or he will destroy you. How? Raistlin asked suddenly and his strange eyes flared with a strange, intense light. How will he destroy me? he repeated. Lightning bolts? Flood and fire? Perhaps another fiery mountain? He took another step toward her. Chrysania moved coolly away from him, only to back into her chair. Gripping the hard wooden back firmly, she walked around it, then turned to face him. It is your own doom, you mock, she replied quietly. Wasteland's lip twisted further still, but he continued talking as if he had not heard her words. Illiston, Wasteland's voice sank to a hissing whisper. He will send Illiston to destroy me, the mage shrugged. But no, surely not. By all reports, the great and holy cleric of Paladine is tired, feeble, dying. No, Chrysania cried, then bit her lip, angry that this man had goaded her into showing her feelings. She paused, drawing a deep breath. Paladine's ways are not to be questioned or mocked, she said with ice-like calm, but she could not help her voice from softening almost imperceptibly. And Eliston's health is no concern of yours. 
Perhaps I take a greater interest in his health than you realize, Wasteland replied with what was to Chrysania a sneering smile. Chrysania felt blood pound in her temples. Even as he had spoken, the mage moved around the chair, coming nearer the young woman. He was so close to her now that Chrysania could feel a strange, unnatural heat radiate from his body through his black robes. She could smell a faintly cloying but pleasant scent about him, a spiciness. His spell components, she realized suddenly. The thought sickened and disgusted her. Holding the medallion of Paladine in her hand, feeling its smoothly chiseled edges bite into her flesh, she moved away from him again. Paladine came to me in a dream, she said haughtily. Raistlin laughed. Few there were who had ever heard the mage laugh, and those who had heard it remembered it always, resounding through their darkest dreams. It was thin, high-pitched, and sharp as a blade. It denied all goodness, mocked everything right and true, and it pierced Chrysania's soul. Very well, Chrysania said, staring at him with a disdain that hardened her bright gray eyes to steel blue. I have done my best to divert you from this course. I have given you fair warning. Your destruction is now in the hands of the gods. Suddenly, perhaps realizing the fearlessness with which she confronted him, Raistlin's laughter ceased. Regarding her intently, his golden eyes narrowed. Then he smiled a secret inner smile of such strange joy that Astinus, watching the exchange between the two, rose to his feet. The historian's body blocked the light of the fire. His shadow fell across them both. Raistlin started almost in alarm. Half turning, he regarded Astinus with a burning, menacing stare. Beware, old friend, the mage warned, or would you meddle with history? I do not meddle. Astinus replied, as you well know. I am an observer, a recorder. In all things I am neutral. I know your schemes, your plans, as I know the schemes and plans of all who draw breath this day. Therefore hear me, Raistlin Magir, and heed this warning. This one is beloved of the gods, as her name implies. Beloved of the gods? So are we all, are we not, revered daughter? Raistlin asked, turning to face Chrysania once more. His voice was soft as the velvet of his robes. Is that not written in the discs of Mishakal? Is that not what the godly Elliston teaches? Yes, Chrysania said slowly, regarding him with suspicion, expecting more mockery. But his metallic face was serious. He had the appearance suddenly of a scholar intelligent, wise. So it is written. She smiled coldly. I am pleased to find you have read the sacred discs, though you obviously have not learned from them. Do you not recall what is said in the... She was interrupted by Astinus, snorting. I have been kept from my studies long enough. The historian crossed the marble floor to the door of the antechamber. Ring for Bertram when you are ready to depart. Farewell, revered daughter. Farewell, old friend. Astinus opened the door. The peaceful silence of the library flowed into the room, bathing Chrysania in refreshing coolness. She felt herself in control, and she relaxed. Her hand let loose of the medallion. Formally and gracefully she bowed her farewell to Astinus, as did Raistlin and then the door shut behind the historian. The two were alone. For long moments, neither spoke. Then Chrysania, feeling Paladine's power flowing through her, turned to face Raistlin. I had forgotten that it was you and those with you who recovered the sacred discs. Of course you would have read them. I would like to discuss them with you further, but henceforth in any future dealings we might have, Raistlin Magir, she said in her cool voice, I will ask you to speak of Elliston more respectfully. He... She stopped, amazed, watching in alarm as the mage's slender body seemed to crumble before her eyes. Racked by spasms of coughing, clutching his chest, Raistlin gasped for breath. He staggered. 
If it had not been for the staff he leaned upon, he would have fallen to the floor. Forgetting her aversion and her disgust, reacting instinctively, Chrysania reached out and, putting her hands upon his shoulders, murmured a healing prayer. Beneath her hands the black robes were soft and warm. She could feel Raceland's muscles twisting in spasms, sense his pain and suffering. Pity filled her heart. Raceland jerked away from her touch, shoving her to one side. His coughing gradually eased. Able to breathe freely once more, he regarded her with scorn. Do not waste your prayers on me, revered daughter, he said bitterly. Pulling a soft cloth from his robes, he dabbed his lips, and Chrysania saw that it came away stained with blood. There is no cure for my malady. This is the sacrifice, the price I paid for my magic. I don't understand, she murmured. Her hands twitched as she remembered vividly the velvety soft smoothness of the black robes, and she unconsciously clasped her fingers behind her back. Don't you? Raistlin asked, staring deep into her soul with his strange golden eyes. What was the sacrifice you made for your power? A faint flush, barely visible in the dying firelight, stained Chrysania's cheeks with blood, much as the mage's lips were stained. Alarmed at this invasion of her being, she averted her face, her eyes looking once more out the window. Night had fallen over Palanthus. The silver moon Solinari was a sliver of light in the dark sky. The red moon that was its twin had not yet risen. The black moon, she caught herself wondering, where is it? Can he truly see it? I must go, Raistlin said, his breath rasping in his throat. These spasms weaken me. I need rest. Certainly. Chrysania felt herself calm once more. All the ends of her emotions tucked back neatly into place, she turned to face him again. I thank you for coming, but our business is not concluded, Raislin said softly. I would like a chance to prove to you that these fears of your god are unfounded. I have a suggestion. Come visit me in the Tower of High Sorcery. There you will see me among my books and understand my studies. When you do, your mind will be at ease. As it teaches in the discs, we fear only that which is unknown. He took a step nearer her. Astounded at his proposal, Quisania's eyes opened wide. She tried to move away from him, but she had inadvertently let herself become trapped by the window. I cannot go to the tower. She faltered as his nearness smothered her, stole her breath. She tried to walk around him, but he moved his staff slightly, blocking her path. Coldly, she continued. The spells laid upon it keep out all except those I choose to admit, Raistlin whispered. Folding the blood-stained cloth, he tucked it back into a secret pocket of his robes. Then, reaching out, he took hold of Chrysania's hand. How brave you are! Revered daughter, he commented. You do not tremble at my evil touch. Paladine is with me, Chrysania replied disdainfully. Raistlin smiled, a warm smile, dark and secret, a smile for just the two of them. It fascinated Chrysania. He drew her near to him. Then he dropped her hand. Resting the staff against the chair, he reached out and took hold of her head with his slender hands, placing his fingers over the white hood she wore. Now Chrysania trembled at his touch, but she could not move. She could not speak or do anything more than stare at him in a wild fear she could neither suppress nor understand. Holding her firmly, Raistlin leaned down and brushed his blood-flecked lips across her forehead. As he did so, he muttered strange words. Then he released her. Chrysania stumbled, nearly falling. She felt weak and dizzy. Her hand went to her forehead where the touch of his lips burned into her skin with a searing pain. What have you done? she cried brokenly. You cannot cast a spell upon me. My faith protects... Of course. Raistlin sighed wearily, and there was an expression of sorrow in his face and voice. 
the sorrow of one who is constantly suspected, misunderstood. I have simply given you a charm that will allow you to pass through Shoiken Grove. That way will not be easy, his sarcasm returned. But undoubtedly your faith will sustain you. Pulling his hood low over his eyes, the mage bowed silently to Chrysania, who could only stare at him. Then he walked toward the door with slow, faltering steps. Reaching out a skeletal hand, he pulled the bell rope. The door opened and Bertram entered so swiftly and suddenly that Chrysania knew he must have been posted outside. Her lips tightened. She flashed the aesthetic such a furious, imperious glance that the man paled visibly, though totally unaware of what crime he had committed, and mopped his shining forehead with the sleeve of his robe. Raceland started to leave, but Chrysania stopped him. I... I apologize for not trusting you, Raceland Majir, she said softly. And again, I thank you for coming. Raceland turned. And I apologize for my sharp tongue, he said. Farewell, revered daughter. If you truly do not fear knowledge, then come to the tower two nights from this night, when Lunatari makes its first appearance in the sky. I will be there, Chrysania answered firmly, noting with pleasure Bertram's look of shocked horror. Nodding in goodbye, she rested her hand lightly on the back of the ornately carved wooden chair. The mage left the room. Bertram followed, shutting the door behind him. Left alone in the warm, silent room, Chrysania fell to her knees before the chair. Oh, thank you, Paladine, she breathed. I accept your challenge. I will not fail you. I will not fail. Book One Chapter One Behind her, she could hear the sound of clawed feet scrapping through the leaves of the forest. Tika tensed, but tried to act as if she didn't hear, luring the creature on. Firmly, she gripped her sword in her hand. Her heart pounded. Closer and closer came the footsteps. She could hear the harsh breathing. The touch of a clawed hand fell upon her shoulder. Whirling about, Tika swung her sword and knocked a tray full of mugs to the floor with a crash. Desra shrieked and sprang backward in alarm. Patrons sitting at the bar burst into raucous laughter. Tika knew her face must be as red as her hair. Her heart was pounding, her hands shook. Desra, she said coldly, you have all the grace and brains of a gully dwarf. Perhaps you and Rafe should switch places. You carry out the garbage and I'll let him wait tables. Desra looked up from where she knelt, picking broken pieces of crockery up off the floor where they floated in a sea of beer. Perhaps I should, the waitress cried, tossing the pieces back onto the floor. Wait tables yourself, or is that beneath you now, Tika Majir, heroine of the lance? Flashing Tika a hurt, reproachful glance, Desra stood up, kicked the broken crockery out of her way, and flounced out of the inn. As the front door banged open, it hit sharply against its frame, making Tika grimace as she envisioned scratches on the woodwork. Sharp words rose to her lips, but she bit her tongue and stopped their utterance, knowing she would regret them later. The door remained standing open, letting the bright light of fading afternoon flood the inn. The ruddy glow of the setting sun gleamed in the bar's freshly polished wood surface and sparkled off the glasses. It even danced on the surface of the puddle on the floor. It touched Tika's flaming red curls teasingly, like the hand of a lover causing many of the sniggering patrons to choke on their laughter and gaze at the comely woman with longing. Not that Tika noticed. Now ashamed of her anger, she peered out the window, where she could see Desra dabbing at her eyes with an apron. A customer entered the open door, dragging it shut behind him. The light vanished, leaving the inn once more in cool half-darkness. Tika brushed her hand across her own eyes. What kind of monster am I turning into? She asked herself remorsefully. After all, it wasn't Desra's fault. It's this horrible feeling inside of me. I almost wish there were draconians to fight again. At least then I knew what I feared. At least then I could fight it with my own hands. 
How can I fight something I can't even name? Voices broke in on her thoughts, clamoring for ale, for food. Laughter rose, echoing through the inn of the last home. This is what I came back to find. Tika sniffed and wiped her nose with the bar rag. This is my home. These people are as right and beautiful and warm as the setting sun. I'm surrounded by the sounds of love, laughter, good fellowship, a lapping dog. Lapping dog? Tika groaned and hurried out from behind the bar. Rafe, she exclaimed, staring at the gully dwarf in despair. Beer spill, me mop up, he said, looking at her and cheerfully wiping his hand across his mouth. Several of the old-time customers laughed, but there were a few new to the inn who were staring at the gully dwarf in disgust. Use this rag to clean it up, Tika hissed out of the corner of her mouth as she grinned weakly at the customers in apology. She tossed Rafe the bar rag, and the gully dwarf caught it, but he only held it in his hand, staring at it with a mystified expression. What me do with this? Clean up the spill, Tika scolded, trying unsuccessfully to shield him from the customer's view with her long flowing skirt. Oh, me not need that, Rafe said solemnly. Me not get nice rag dirty. Handing the cloth back to Tika, the gully dwarf got down on all fours again and began to lick up the spilled beer, now mingled with tracked-in mud. Her cheeks burning, Tika reached down and jerked Rafe up by his collar, shaking him. Use the rag, she whispered furiously. The customers are losing their appetites, and when you're finished with that, I want you to clear off that big table near the fire pit. I'm expecting friends. Tika stopped. Rafe was staring at her, wide-eyed, trying to absorb the complicated instructions. He was exceptional, as gully dwarves go. He'd only been there three weeks, and Tika had already taught him to count to three. Few gully dwarves ever get past two and had finally gotten rid of his stench. This newfound intellectual prowess combined with cleanliness would have made him a king in a gully dwarf realm, but Rafe had no such ambitions. He knew no king lived like he did, mopping up spilled beer, if he were quick, and taking out the garbage. But there were limits to Rafe's talents, and Tika had just reached them. I'm expecting friends, and... She started again, then gave up. Oh, never mind. Just mop this up. With the rag, she added severely. Then come to me to find out what to do next. Me no drink? Rafe began, then caught Tika's furious glare. Me do. Sighing in disappointment, the gully dwarf took the rag back and slopped it around, muttering about waste good beer. Then he picked up pieces of the broken mugs, and after staring at them a moment, grinned and stuck them in the pockets of his shirt. Tika wondered briefly what he planned to do with them, but knew it was wiser not to ask. Returning to the bar, she grabbed some more mugs and filled them, trying not to notice that Rafe had cut himself on some of the sharper pieces and was now leaning back on his heels, watching with intense interest the blood drip from his hand. Have you, uh, seen Caramon? Tika asked the gully dwarf casually. Nope. Rafe wiped his bloody hand in his hair. But me know where to look. He leaped up eagerly. Me go find? No, snapped Tika, frowning. Caramon's at home. Me no think so, Rafe said, shaking his head. Not after sun go down. He's home, Tika snapped so angrily that the gully dwarf shrank away from her. You want to make bet? Rafe muttered, but well under his breath. Tika's temper these days was as fiery as her flaming hair. Fortunately for Rafe, Tika didn't hear him. She finished filling the beer mugs, then carried the tray over to a large party of elves seated near the door. I'm expecting friends, she repeated to herself dully. Dear friends. Once she would have been so excited, so eager to see Tannis and Riverwind. Now, she sighed, handing out the beer mugs without conscious awareness of what she was doing. Name of the true gods, she prayed, let them come and go quickly. Yes, above all, go quickly. If they stayed, if they found out. Tika's heart sank at the thought. Her lower lip trembled. 
If they stayed, that would be the end. Plain and simple. Her life would be over. The pain was suddenly more than she could bear. Hurriedly setting the last beer mug down, Tika left the elves, blinking her eyes rapidly. She did not notice the bemused gazes the elves exchanged among themselves as they stared at the beer mugs, and she never did remember that they had all ordered wine. Half blinded by her tears, Tika's only thought was to escape to the kitchen where she could weep unseen. The elves looked about for another waitress, and Rafe, sighing in contentment, got back down on his hands and knees, happily lapping up the rest of the beer. Tannis Half-Elven stood at the bottom of a small rise, staring up the long, straight, muddy road that stretched ahead of him. The woman he escorted and their mounts waited some distance behind him. The woman had been in need of rest, as had their horses. Though her pride had kept her from saying a word, Tannis saw her face was gray and drawn with fatigue. Once today, in fact, she had nodded off to sleep in the saddle, and would have fallen but for Tannis's strong arm. Therefore, though eager to reach her destination, she had not protested when Tannis stated that he wanted to scout the road ahead alone. He helped her from her horse, and saw her settled in a hidden thicket. He had misgivings about leaving her unattended, but he sensed that the dark creatures pursuing them had fallen far behind. His insistence on speed had paid off, though both he and the woman were aching and exhausted. Tannis hoped to stay ahead of the things until he could turn his companion over to the one person on Crin who might be able to help her. They had been riding since dawn, fleeing a horror that had followed them since leaving Palanthus. What it was exactly, Tannis, with all his experience during the wars, could not name, and that made it all the more frightening. Never there, when confronted, it was only seen from the corner of the eye that was looking for something else. His companion had sensed it too, he could tell, though characteristically she was too proud to admit to fear. Walking away from the thicket, Tannis felt guilty. He shouldn't be leaving her alone, he knew. He shouldn't be wasting precious time. All his warrior senses protested. But there was one thing he had to do, and he had to do it alone. To do otherwise would have seemed sacrilege. And so Tannis stood at the bottom of the hill, summoning his courage to move forward. Anyone looking at him might have supposed he was advancing to fight an ogre. But that was not the case. Tannis half-elven was returning home, and he both longed for and dreaded his first sight. The afternoon sun was beginning its downward journey toward night. It would be dark before he reached the inn, and he dreaded traveling the roads by night. But once there, this nightmarish journey would be over. He would leave the woman in capable hands and continue on to Qualanesti. But first, there was this he had to face. With a deep sigh, Tannis Half-Elven drew his green hood up over his head and began the climb. Topping the rise, his gaze fell upon a large, moss-covered boulder. For a moment, his memories overwhelmed him. He closed his eyes, feeling the sting of swift tears beneath the lids. Stupid quest, he heard the dwarf's voice echo in his memory. Silliest thing I ever did. Flint, my old friend. I can't go on, Tannis thought. This is too painful. Why did I ever agree to come back? It holds nothing for me now, nothing except the pain of old wounds. My life is good at last. Finally I am at peace, happy. Why? Why did I tell them I would come? Drawing a shuddering sigh, he opened his eyes and looked at the boulder. Two years ago, it would be three this autumn, he had topped this rise and met his longtime friend, the dwarf Flint Fireforge, sitting on that boulder, carving wood and complaining as usual. That meeting had set in motion events that had shaken the world, culminating in the War of the Lance, the battle that cast the Queen of Darkness back into the abyss and broke the might of the Dragon High Lords. Now I am a hero, Tannis thought, glancing down ruefully at the gaudy panoply he wore, breastplate of a knight of Salomnia, green silken sash, mark of the wild runners of Sylvanesti, the elves' most honored legions, the medallion of Karas, the dwarves' highest honor.
plus countless others. No one, human, elf, or half-elf, had been so honored. It was ironic. He who hated armor, who hated ceremony, now forced to wear it as befitting his station. How the old dwarf would have laughed. You, a hero. He could almost hear the dwarf snort. But Flint was dead. He had died two years ago this spring, in Tannis's arms. Why the beard? He could swear once again that he heard Flint's voice, the first words he had said upon seeing the half-elf in the road. You were ugly enough. Tannis smiled and scratched the beard that no elf on Kryn could grow, the beard that was the outward visible sign of his half-human heritage. Flint knew well enough why the beard, Tannis thought, gazing fondly at the sun-warmed boulder. He knew me better than I knew myself. He knew of the chaos that raged inside my soul. He knew I had a lesson to learn. And I learned it, Tannis whispered to the friend who was with him in spirit only. I learned it, Flint. But, oh, it was bitter. The smell of wood smoke came to Tannis. That, and the slanting rays of the sun and the chill in the spring air, reminded him he still had some distance to travel. Turning, Tannis half-elven looked down into the valley where he had spent the bittersweet years of his young manhood. Turning, Tannis half-elven looked down upon Solace. It had been autumn when he last saw the small town. The fallen wood trees in the valley had been ablaze with the season's colors, the brilliant reds and golds fading into the purple of the peaks of the Carolus Mountains beyond. The deep azure of the sky mirrored in the still waters of Crystal Mere Lake. There had been a haze of smoke over the valley, the smoke of home fires burning in the peaceful town that had once roosted in the fallen wood trees like contented birds. He and Flint had watched the lights flicker on one by one in the houses that sheltered among the leaves of the huge trees. Solace. Tree City. One of the beauties and wonders of Kryn. For a moment, Tannis saw the vision in his mind's eye as clearly as he had seen it two years before. Then the vision faded. Then it had been autumn. Now it was spring. The smoke was there still, the smoke of the home fires. But now it came mostly from houses built on the ground. There was the green of living, growing things, but it only seemed, in Tannis's mind, to emphasize the black scars upon the land. Scars that could never be totally erased, though here and there he saw the marks of the plow across them.